Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Lovely to have you here again. Um, it's been a week since we last had a wee chat. And here we are again. The time goes round very quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm not got a special guest, although all my guests are special. Uh, special guest this week because there's so much for us to talk about. Um, and I've got, I'm joined, of course, by uh, Ian Lawson, the, the Paisley Mohawk, and the Coatbridge Cavalier, Phil Boswell, who's uh, he's in the Phil's over there in Albania. I'm here in Dubai, and Ian's in Paisley. So you're getting a wee international flavour. And uh, so, welcome, gentlemen. How are we? Very good. This is the last broadcast I'll be doing from Paisley for a while. Okay, so I'm about to cross the pond to yes. my other home in Clearwater, so uh, the future broadcasts will be coming from the United States. Yeah, uh, if it's still there, if there's not, a, it's not on mute with this things that are going on in Ukraine, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> uh, but uh, we we'll just say a, a shout out to the Fife Laku, Alba Laku, who the three of us were invited to be guests at last night, an enjoyable meeting, um, their branch meeting. Um, I enjoyed it. It was, a, it was a good old chinwag, was it not, Phil? Oh. It was excellent oh. to see cross-party um, engagement on the primary issue of independence. That's what it should be all about, full stop. Yeah. And you enjoyed it, Ian? Very much so. I was very pleased to see there was quite a few of the audience or our audience uh, at the meeting uh, expounding how good it had been on uh, Twitter last evening. So... Uh, it's always nice when you, you do something and then you see that people actually appreciated it afterwards and were confident enough to go on to Twitter and tell everybody what they'd missed. Yeah, well, and to any of you like who's out there who would like uh, the three amigos here to come and have a wee chat and a wee meeting with you, you know, get in touch and we'll do that. Or SNP um, branches. Or SNP branches or yes groups, anyone, anyone, anyone who wants us. We'll even go and talk to unionists and convert you. We'll, we'll do that for you. Bring you over to the from the dark side, um, but the one thing, one of the things we were talking about last night, and we should start with it right away. It was happening live. We didn't know. I think when we went on the air, there was two resignations in Downing Street. Phil, by the end of the meeting, I think there was four. God, I'm, I'm not up to date. Have you heard any more resignations? But it, it seems to be imploding, Phil. Yeah, there there is there is inevitability about it because that's what it's designed for. Um, this group are designed to take the hit. I just don't think the Conservatives were planning on allowing it to hit before it hit rock bottom, before the plummet Brexit driven hit rock bottom, because who's going to carry the can if not Boris and his lackeys? That's what they're designed, that's what they're there for. They, they're in there, they'll get the payoff, they'll carry the can, and Boris the buffoon and his team of incompetence will carry the can and the blame um, for. Brexit, when in fact it's it's a strategy that's been mainstream conservative, and they'll just bring in a more professional team because let's face it, it could be it could not be any less professional the team they've put in place. This is not accidental. The Tories are not fools; they're organised, disciplined, and ruthless. And this is what they're bringing to this. The, welcome. I hope you're happy, everybody that voted no. I hope you're happy, everybody that voted Brexit, because if you're not paying attention, what you're seeing is all the signs of a crash. Ian, yeah. um, you, were, you, were, you were keeping us up to date last night. Um, have you had any, how many more resignations today? Do we know? There was another one today as well, uh, a fifth one. But I mean, I think this is all to some extent false because I think they were probably told by Boris, either resign or I'm going to sack you. And, you know, uh, I think they're jumping before it gets to that point. But, I mean, the Tories can be very, very cruel. I mean, the girl that was the head of policy, uh, they described her as being Boris's brain for the last 14 years. I mean, what, what hope does she have of getting another job after that? I mean, that was really putting the knife in. There was no need to go that far, you know. But, I mean, it was all his top people. I mean, it was his se most senior private secretary, his head of communications, his head of policy. 
Uh, I don't know exactly what the girl that resigned today was because she was pictured in a boxing outfit. Uh, and uh, She's maybe one of the BBC, bouncers for the parties. You never know. The BBC were rather cruel, saying she'd thrown her last punch. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> uh, but it's, but, uh, but the, the Tories but are trying mess. to spin it. It's a total mess. Phil's right. I mean, uh, the, the Tory plan was to put Brexit. They knew Brexit would be bad. So the plan was to have Boris there, Boris to be high up in the Leave campaign, run it. At the end of the day, when the worst effects of Brexit became known, they would ditch them at that point. Phil's right, this has come earlier than they planned. I mean, Brexit's bad, but it's been covered up by the media because COVID's been in the go. But COVID is less of a story now, and it's becoming more and more obvious just how bad Brexit is. So uh, I think they would have liked Bre uh, Boris to stay maybe another year, year and a half, and then fall on his sword at that point. If we get rid of him now, then uh, the, the people that are queuing up to be his successor are going to inherit the Brexit problem. And that yeah. wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, well, the Tories are trying to spin it as if it was all part of his grand plan and he's still a genius and he's, uh, you know, he was going to get rid of all these people because they mm -hmm. had the... Uh, what he thought was office uh, office nights, which were parties and all the stuff. But I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think they were going to be the scapegoats. Um, yeah. So, well, because it's getting really bad. I mean, I was reading some statistics today. Uh, inflation's running at 7%. Um, savings, if you've got money, if, if you're one of these lucky people that's got some savings, you're getting a 0.5 return on that. Um, credit cards, what, they're at, what, 25% just now? Something daft like that. Um, incomes are dropping. Um, Ian, there's a crash coming. Pain oh, uh, is coming. It's on its way. There's, there's no doubt there's a crash coming. Absolutely certain. And I mean, I feel for young couples, particularly ones that aren't on a fixed mortgage term, because mortgages are going to go up. Uh, and if you're not on a fixed term over a period, you, you know, you've missed the boat to some extent. Because if you go to the banks now, they know inflation's coming. You're not going to get anything like the fixed deal that was on the go a couple of years ago. So I, I think there's so much pressure. As you say, food prices are soaring. Energy prices are soaring. Mortgage costs will soon be uh, soaring. All that will have an impact on the housing market. And when it does have an impact in the housing market, house prices will fall. Uh, more and more young people will find themselves in negative equity and business confidence will, will, will depreciate and investment in these circumstances will also depreciate because you don't want to be investing huge amounts of money at a time when inflation's taken off uh, because yeah. you know, you're know you not going to probably get the same true return as you would if the economy was stable. Yep. Uh, we're all old enough to remember, well, at least I certainly am, um, you know, the crash that came with, just before, you know, the pound in your pocket and all that jazz. Yeah, the, the, the devaluation. One, yeah. The yeah. We remember that was bad. And, and then along course came Scottish oil, which saved their bacon fill. Um, and they got out of it. It was bad. And with the crash after the dot com bust, and we've had the bank crash, bad. But it's nothing, nothing in comparison to what's coming down the line just now, is it? No, and it, it gives none of us any pleasure to say we told you so. And, and we haven't done so. And the big criticism that comes against the indie movement is you didn't explain it. You didn't sit me down and explain it. And the only thing I can answer to that is we never had the opportunity because we don't control the media. The media is controlled by the same people that are pulling Boris's strings, Boris, Boris and his cabal. And if you're not interested in the future for you, the best future for your children, then you're betraying your children's future. You're not, you, you're not worthy of being called a, a responsible parent if you're not doing that. So, and I get this from people who are close to me who are doing okay and think I'm all right, Jack. Um, it won't affect me. But the horror of what's to come, and, and, and it, I, 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 I could weep. I could weep. The, the, the things I've seen, I've been very fortunate enough, time in the police, 
Time working with Chris's house, the suicide charity, time in Parliament, at, at, the, at the, the state that people are currently in, and it's getting worse, and it's snowballing. And the people that are going to fall out of our society, our supposedly modern, Western, caring, socialist philosophy society, it's an absolute disgrace, and we're responsible. See, everybody, everybody that allowed this to happen, you're accountable. It's like George Orwell said, if you stand by, you know, if you vote for corrupt politicians, you're not a victim, you're an accomplice. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's the truth. I, I, I saw today in um, a, a meme from uh, during the referendum, we're better together, we're saying, you know, stay in the UK for, um, you know, energy prices will stay low. <laughs> I mean, now for all times, um, I, I was just reading another article today where if you take, let's just take Scotland. Scotland um, has excess and everything. We have enough gas to still export gas. We have more than enough gas to take care of all our needs. We have more than enough fuel, oil to take care of all our needs. We have enough renewables to take care of all our needs and we've got it to export. Yeah, the UK, England, let's be honest, England imports 100% of its oil. It's importing 60, 70% of its electricity. Most of it's taken from us. Um, but from comes from France as well, they're bringing some in from even oil and ga gas rather in from Russia. Um, <laughs> the prices are going up through the roof here, and, and that is going to fall into what I'm just talking about. A seven percent inflation is going to quickly become double figures, um, yeah. and people are not going to be able to meet their bills. Well, I mean, I feel for people, all people, but particularly those in fixed incomes. Because you pointed out, even if they've got some savings, they're getting absolutely no interest at half percent. It's not going to go anywhere close to keeping up with inflation. So they're sitting at home facing ever-increasing bills and watching the value of any savings, if they have them, dwindling away uh, uh, as the cost of inflation. So it's a very, very rocky road. Everyone is going to be on other than the super rich. And you're completely right. I mean, Scotland is in an incredibly lucky position, but it would be if we had decent politicians, if mm -hmm. Scotland had voted yes. You know, mm -hmm. uh, all this would have been avoided. You know, if Scotland had voted yes, we would not be having to pay to put electricity into the national grid system, all at free to the national grid. We've got to pay to put it on there. And then it's sold back to us. Sold back because we've given it away for nothing. And then it's sold back to us, you know, at an exorbitant rate. Similarly, with gas, we self-sufficient in gas, always have been. So none of this would have been happening in Scotland, none of it, you know. And nor would the food shortages either, because Scotland by now, you know, four or five years, well, seven years on, from that referendum. We'd have developed by now our own direct ferry links to Europe. We would have more air routes to Europe. All that has been thrown away. And I was actually writing a, a blog this morning and I headed it up. We're not really very good at this, are we? And what, what, what it was was about the importance of electing the right people to look after your nation's interests. And sadly, we've been very bad at it in Scotland. We get nothing out of oil because we were voting Labour at the time and Labour told us it would only last 10 years at the same time as they were burying the Macron report. Then we were told we all had sunset industries under Thatcher and she shut down as much as she could, including steel, you know. And, you know, this is a nation where there's an enormous history of engineering now, what do you need, you know, to be successful engineers? Well, I would suggest steel would be a good starting point, you know? And the way British steel worked was where you're charged for steel based on your nearest point to the, one of the major five steel works in Britain. So if you bought steel, it didn't matter where it came from in Britain, you would only be charged the transport cost from Ravenscraig out to wherever it was getting delivered. The minute they shut Ravenscraig, that pricing point moved south of the border. So all of a sudden, all the steel-dependent companies 
in Scotland, but I'm getting charged a lot more for the steel to be delivered than they were when Ravens Craig was open. So, I mean, the whole thing is a complete setup. I remember, you know, way back, my dad worked in Covils when it was private industry. And, uh, I mean, he said at the time, the minute it became a nationalised industry, controlled from Westminster, that was the end of the Scottish steel industry. It would only be a matter of time from there on in. And it's so true in so many different industries. We lose control in Scotland. We lost control of oil. We lost control of steel. We lost control of renewable energy. You know, I, I mean, look at that deal. 700 million forever in perpetuity. We sold off the rights to that for 700 million pounds. An absolute tiny fraction of the worth of that. And it's not just selling off. We lost control of it with that sale. Yeah. So I'm yeah. asking, why is the First Minister of Scotland been around trying to kid people in Scotland on? That was a good deal. That was a disgrace. That was a sellout. That was a, the exact same as Labour had done with the oil. She should be ashamed of herself. Yeah, she should be. But while, while we're on that subject, Phil, you're a man with, in from the oil industry. You know, as Ian points out, we gave away in perpetuity a one-off payment of 700 million for the, the seabeds around Scotland. Um, and there was today, Shell announced, just one energy company um, are giving their shareholders 8.5 billion this year, just this year, 8.5 billion um, in uh, dividends because of the, the, the extra money they're making out of fuel from gas uh, and, and energy. And yet, here in, in, the, in the UK, we have to pay 54% increase on average. In France, it's only 4%. There's something, something. It's your, your favourite phrase, Phil, something in the state of Denmark stinks. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And having been on the inside, I've got to be a little bit careful what I say. I work for Shell. And Shell's revenue, um, big revenue, comes internationally. It's obviously a Dutch, Anglo-Dutch company. But just for one example... You know, the eight and a half billion, that's about the, the turnover or profit. It was about 30 million a day on Quad 204 for 35 years that we were going to be making on that project. Now, it depends on the oil price. It depends on extraction costs. That's just one project. Over a year, that's 11 billion. 11 billion for one project, 30 million a day. That's one project, Quad 204. One, one set of forecast figures. Eight and a half billion dividend for the whole of Shell stakeholders across the planet. Seven, com, compare all of this to 700 million. That's 700 million for the Crown Estate. And Queen Elizabeth does rather well out of this deal. In fact, I believe she does rather better than the Scottish people. And I believe the, the legal situation was that the, the ministers uh, in Scotland were looking after it on her behalf, but technically there was some ownership claim from the Queen, from the Crown. Another argument for the Republic, another argument for don't play by their rules. Why and my, why my party has engaged, not for the first time and sadly not for the last time, in the games of the colonialists that is Westminster. We are a colony, we are treated with contempt and we are having the urine extracted again and again and again. And rage, what, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Oh, well, we have to do something. But the other thing, you know, just to add insult to injury, and the Bank of England have announced today that um, we should expect inflation, that we should expect wage restriction. Um, to, you know, absolute neoliberal. Um, policy uh, and as you've pointed out earlier in, in the question, one of the questions it's not the Boris Johnsons or the Nicola Sturgeons or the, the Ian Blackfords or whoever that are going to suffer, it's we Tam and Mary and you know John and Jenny with two wains uh, and one wage, they're going to the pain is going to be excruciating Well I think that's what I was getting at in my earlier answer I mean the politicians I've completely lost the place here. I don't oh, think they're living in the real world. 
thrilled. I mean, I, I don't go out that much as much as I used to, but I still meet enough people in Scotland to know that a lot of people are living right on the edge to snow yeah. long before these huge increases take place. And I know older people that are genuinely deciding whether to turn a one bar heater on or to eat a meal, you know, once a day. And I mean, it's completely false economy. If you don't heat pensioners' houses properly, if you don't feed them properly, then they fall ill. And when they fall in, well, that becomes a cost on the National Health Service, probably far greater than it would be to provide them with a, a meal a day and, and a bit of decent heat in their homes. Certainly, the other thing is, I mean, how, lot, how incompetent do you have to be to have lived in a climate like Scotland? We know this is a cold country. We know this is a damp country. And yet, over all these years since oil was discovered, none of it has been spent in properly insulating houses in Scotland. If you actually wanted to, you know, make a contribution, make it easier, you should be re reducing what you're using in energy and fuel by insulating your houses. And, you know, we can do that. I mean, it's not as if it's rocket science. It can be done. And some of the oil profits over all these years should have been spent on that. Instead, we're living in a country where all our resources are taken away for free. What resources are put back in, we get charged for, you know? Uh, yeah, even these rebates are supposedly coming from Westminster. Uh, uh, a lot of it's coming in the form of loans. You're going to get, we're going to give you a few hundred quid and you'll be paying back at 40 pounds a year, uh, you know, in perpetuity. And, that, you know, uh, it's a complete insult. We are a colony. Phil's absolutely right. We're treated like a colony. You can only get away with what they do in this country if we were a colony. So there's no point in denying it. Folks, folk got upset. You say, you know, we're living in a colony. Oh, no, I'm not. You're British. I say, no, well, <laughs> you know, you're, you're getting con, son, you know. Think, mm. think about it for a minute. You know, here, what about what we've got to pay on, on the grid? You know, what, what are we getting paid for all this electricity that's falling down? Have, have you ever got a penny, a, a penny for it? No. I <laughs> said, you, you pay lots of pennies to buy it back. You know, it's a bit time we wise though. I mean, at the end of the day, this has been going on all my life. You know, and there's far too many people in Scotland who just take no interest. Life just passes them by. They're great at moaning and grinching, but they've no idea who's doing it to them. And they've no idea what steps they should be taking to stop it. I mean, the, the steps you yeah. need to take is get rid of the folk that let it happen. That's the first mm -hmm. rule. So the people that are letting all this happen and have allowed it to happen over these years, they should not be in well-paid jobs in Hollywood or in Westminster. They should have been removed by the people of Scotland and people with a bit of fight, a wee bit of vision. They should have been in, in Parliament. Any bit of brain goes nowhere near Parliament these days because it's a, it's a career club for second and third-rate brains yep. where they collect together and do what some other person tells them. If we, weren't a, if we weren't a colony, why do we have to ask permission to hold a Section 30 referendum? There you go. Well, all this is going on, Philip. Um, the Glasgow uh, SNP group have decided uh, in May to campaign. They want the Scottish government to increase the price of fuel um, uh, so that people will be forced onto public transport. At a time, as we've pointed out in this show, where the prices are going through the roof, um, they want further increases. Uh, they seem to forget that some people, a car is not a, uh, it's a necessity because the public transport actually isn't that great. I would, I would understand if we had, you know, with as many tube lines as they have in London, we've got one with 16 stations. If we had uh, an integrated transport policy, then you'd say, well, this is on trams and all that sort of stuff. But, so you're going to put the price of fuel. What public transport are they talking about for? Well, that's the first point. I want to know who's responsible for this. Where did this decision come from? Because it's somebody, it's clearly from somebody that either is in, in cahoots with the establishment in London or hasn't got the first clue about energy prices or transportation. Because 
you live anywhere outside the big cities, you're struggling to get transport to anywhere. And that's all across, particularly particularly anywhere outside the big towns or the central belt. But it's not just that. It's how naive have you got to be to think by putting an increase on energy costs that the rich are going to pay for this? Who's going to suffer here? Who's going to pay this price here? The people on edge that Ian were talking about earlier, the numbers of people who are already making these decisions, they'll have that decision taken away from them because they can't eat the house. They've got to survive on the food they can buy. And these numbers are increasing. And it's not people who, who usually get blamed benefits, people on benefits. That's who usually gets the blame. We know it's not. It's working people that are, do, that are going through this pain right now. And the naivety, I'm, I'm raging at whoever this... Whoever these people are, whoever these are individuals are responsible, come on down the pub. Let, 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 I want to meet them. I want to meet them. And I want an explanation from them. Show me your signs. Show me your evidence. Where's the logic in this? Who's advising you? Who are you working for? Is more, is more the question. <laughs> oh, no, no, You're angry there, a, Phil. We can tell. There's, there's a revolution coming here because, you know, I, I mean, Glasgow SNP and the Greens in Glasgow, you know, they're a walking disaster area, you know, and you think about all the big businesses in Glasgow. Oh, I mean, it was, a, it was a great shopping centre. It's been slowly destroyed because now if you take your car into Glasgow, it costs a king's ransom to park it anywhere if you can find a space, you know, uh, and, you know, how do you buy goods if you can't transport them home? You know, I, I can't remember the last time I saw him with a fridge in the back of a bus. You know, I mean, maybe the Greens think that's possible, but, you know, in the real world, that isn't. You know, and I think, you know, they really want to do the sums here because this is juvenile politics. You know, what happens when you shut down all the shops because you get rid of all the car owners coming in to do the shops and you whack the business rates up? Uh, to the point where businesses in the city centres are no longer viable. Well, you know, I suspect the Greens and the SNP in Glasgow are all shareholders in Amazon, you know, because what's going to happen here is everybody's going to get their goods from Amazon. Amazon don't have a place in Glasgow, so there's no rates contribution. But all these goods that are flown in from Amazon and the, the people of Glasgow they're making absolutely no contribution in business rates for them, but they're shutting down a lot of the stores in Glasgow that are paying the big business rates. So, I mean, the long-term economics of this, it's not a pretty picture. And I don't think MD, frankly, in the councils any longer, you know, even think about this, they're all hooked on this daft green, uh, you know, uh, you know, ridiculous economic plan. I mean, Scotland is a tiny, tiny, tiny contributor to global warming. We can sensibly, you know, make reductions. I mean, we're already way ahead of practically every nation in Europe in terms of our contribution, in terms of forestry and all the rest of it, and a clean environment. So, I mean, why should our people suffer ridiculous, uneconomic, daft policies? just to keep the SNP and Greens happy. The, you know, this is daft stuff, and it's going to cost thousands and thousands of jobs. It's going to put prices through the roof. It's going to destroy the future and health of our older pensioners and others in fixed incomes. It's daft. We're on the wrong road totally, and we need to replace just about everybody these days. Now, the, the one thing we were talking earlier um, about some of the... How, appalled we were at the, the, the 700 million sell-off of the seabed. And it was last night, I believe, when we were at five, we just said, you know, you don't want these same people negotiating with perfidious Albion when we, if we ever do get to the independent stage. But the other one, you thought, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, I don't know if you've been following the story, Phil, about the First Minister's great idea to help stop COVID in schools. She wants to cut the bottom off the of doors to increase the ventilation. Um, I read it first, I thought, this has got to be a kid on. And then I saw it on STV actually saying it. I said, why don't you just open the bloody door? Get a doorstep. 
sawing the bottom off of school doors to increase ventilation. This is the, the this is the government that's going to lead us to independence. Help me here, Philip. Tell me I'm I'm wrong. I can't help you, Roddy. That's crass <laughs> idiocy. That I've never heard anything so stupid in my life. Who's responsible for this? I'm serious. How stupid have you got to be to think that that's a good idea? Who's advising these people? What are the qualifications? Is this how you introduce ventilation into a room through the theme of interpretive dance or something? What the hell are they talking about? This is no engineering. This is no ventilation. This is crass idiocy. I, I, I thought you were having a joke, Roddy. I'm in Albania. I thought you were winding me up there. You've succeeded if you were trying that. I actually oh, thought that as well. When I saw her on the STD, uh, uh, she was getting pulled up about it in Parliament. And she was that usual way, you know, that almost that, that way she looks to the floor and how dare you question me? She was really upset that someone had dared to question something she was doing. Ian, it's so unbelievable, incredible, and scary. Well, it is. I mean, I actually watched it in First Minister's Questions. And, you know, it was bothering me when she was trying to blame local authorities and saying at the end of the day, what would happen to improve ventilation would be down to them, not down to her. She was just basically saying, here's some money, sort it out, you know? And, I mean, vague doesn't cover it. I mean, she, there was no specific answers given at any point. It was complete avoidance over the period and hope that nobody noticed uh, that she was shifting it on to the local authorities. Uh, uh, one of the questions she got asked, by the way, Phil, you'll enjoy this, she, she was asked what consultation she'd held with the chief fire officer. Fire doors. <laughs> in, in, in relation to this, you know, hmm? and could she tell them what he said? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, we then got a big avoidance of, it wasn't a hard job to speak to the fire oh, plausible that deniability. Would be, that, that, that would be up to the local authorities to speak to the local fire boards. So, I mean, but, you know, you're right. It's when I say, I mean, Roddy, you know, uh, we probably need a committee, given it's the Scottish government, uh, to look into the use of doorstops. And we'd probably have to source them, you know, mm. and they would probably come from somewhere a long way from Scotland. I mean, there are little trees that would be getting cut down to create a doorstop or two across the country, they would be imported. It's just, it's quite, quite incredible. I mean, I, the, the other thing that I, I got this week, which I found the hypocrisy of it, um, was this story about uh, Good Willie, the footballer, the boy who in the civil court was found to have raped a girl and he'd been playing for Clyde for five years and, and was going to Dunfermline and up in arms. And there no, was Rafe Rafe Rovers. Rafe. He was going to Rafe, yeah, Rafe Rovers. Rovers. Rafe Rovers. But there was there was a bandwagon, and we know our Nicola loves a bandwagon, and she jumped on it, saying, you know, women's safety, um, and you know, you couldn't have rapists going into a, a dressing room full of men. It was just wrong, and that Rafe Rovers and the SPFL should look at this carefully. This is the same woman who's pushing through that rapists should get into women's prisons, to women's refuges. To women's rape crisis centres, uh, and, and any of us who's questioned that are, don't have a valid complaint, but there she is, expressing how terrible it is that this boy, who allegedly, because he was never found guilty in a court of law, it was a, a civil action against him, but whatever, let's even say he was guilty, um, but she's so up in arms about that because it's a danger to women. The hypocrisy, Phil, is, as I put in a tweet, there's not enough brass for that neck. Well, that's one side of it that you've articulated, but the other very serious side is the State of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act. And the rape's horrific. Okay, I, I, I'm mm. currently working. I'm not here now, but I'm in India, which is one of the, the rape capital of the world. It's absolutely horrific. And I was involved as a police officer in a couple of cases, so I know a little bit about it. But as a man... <laughs> I don't know anything about this, you know. Um, however, on a, on a justice perspective, I looked at this a little bit, and Good Willie and the other footballer, they're preyed upon. Men prey upon women, and women prey upon men. Let's, let's not pretend that doesn't happen. Now, the proof, the 
The standard of proof in a criminal action is beyond all reasonable doubt. And the procurator fiscal looked at the evidence and made the determination that he could not prove that the, 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 the Crown could not prove that this alleged rape had taken place. Now, both players deny it to this day, and Good Willie denies it to this day, saying it was consensual sex. The women took, the, took it to court in the civil courts where, where the action is on the balance of probability, and a judge determined for her and awarded her damages. And that takes courage, you know, but that's, that's normal. We ought to remember the anonymity that our society, quite rightly, in my opinion, um, offers women who go through this terrible ordeal or I'll, I'll say they go through this a terrible ordeal is not a right, it's a privilege. But here's the bottom line. If someone makes an accusation, should you believe them because of their sex? No. Should you treat them as if they're telling <coughs> the truth? Absolutely. Should you support them in every possible way you can? Absolutely. Should you try? Should you try for a prosecution? Absolutely. But should you should you treat someone else as not equal in the eyes of the law because of their sex? No, I've got serious issues with where the legal system currently is with this and more concerns about where it's going. So this is a highly contentious issue. And maybe I'll get complaints about it, but we need to talk about these things. This is what adults do. You talk about the difficult issues in life and you deal with them. Uh, Ian, my point is, is, is the double standards of the First Minister, um, who is horrified, apparently, about Mr Goodwillie um, going into Wraith Rovers, but she's not worried about rapists declaring themselves as women and then getting into women's prisons, women's refuges. Um, she has no problem with that. Do you find that hypocritical? Yes, I find that a bit amusing as well. I suppose, you know, it's a strict warning to rapists, that, male rapists that are in women's jails, not to put a football strip on. Because <laughs> if you do, the First Minister's going to take an interest, you know. But I mean, Bandwagon. It is, it is, you know, I, I didn't realise. I mean, I, I remember Goodwillie when he played with Dundee United. I'd lost all track. Aware if he was playing at all, uh, and I was quite surprised when I discovered he'd been playing for Clyde for the last five years. I thought he'd been brought out of retirement by Wraith Rovers, you know, and then signed them to try and get him uh, a few games at that point. I didn't realize he'd been playing for Clyde for five years, so you know, it's very surprising, I think, that it became such a huge issue when he had been playing for Clyde for the five years. Uh, I think one of the reasons maybe the First Minister got involved is uh, the fact that Val McDermott was the shirt sponsor of Wraith Rovers, and she obviously, uh, and understandably, took it quite bad that they signed Goodwillie, uh, given her views uh, on, on rape. Um, and I think she probably nudged the First Minister to get involved. That's me being generous to Nicholas Sturgeon, which is not something that I do very often. No, it's uh, not. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a very unfortunate incident. I think it's very bad news for uh, Goodwillie because presumably uh, he lost his contract with Clyde when he signed with uh, Ruth Rovers. And now that that's been ended, I don't know, nobody's made public yet how that was ended uh, and compensation, if any, was paid to Goodwillie at that point. But he may find it very difficult to get another club now. Uh, given what's happened. Yeah. Well, this brings me on to it's probably the biggest story of the week for us, people who believe in independence. We've been doing it, I've done it all my, my life since the age of 16. I've been fighting that fight. We've all been at it for a new A lot of the people waiting here, looking here, watching us today have been the same. And this week we were told, this is undeniable, that twice the amount of civil servants fell are working on GRA reform than are working on independence for the SNP. Now, I need someone to explain that to me, how that can possibly be the case. Do you know? It's, it, it, it's obvious, sadly and, and sickeningly, that GRA is more important to the current SNP leadership than independence. 
I yeah. can't believe I'm saying that. But how else? How else do you interpret that? I, I'm, I'm lost for words on that one. That, I find that incredible. We've got twice as many civil servants working on GRA as we have on gaining independence, where we can fix the majority of the ills in this country. We can attain our primary, what used to be the primary aspiration of the Scottish National Party, which was independence. And I believe it still is for the majority of us. We, why are we veering down this dead end? Because it is a dead end. It's a dangerous, it's a bad manoeuvre. This, this GRA will end in tears. It already, it already has caused incredible disruption amongst the people of Scotland. And the more people that become aware of it, the more angry parents in particular are becoming. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very angry about it. I've got children at school and I, I find it completely unacceptable. Not in my name. So, um, no, get, get back on track um, and do what you're supposed to do. And it's not, as we talked about earlier, it's not about self-ID. That wasn't in the manifesto. They said they were, they were quite vague about it, and my party was quite vague about what it did. There was a few paragraphs, but it didn't say anything about self-ID. That's mm -hmm. not what it's about. By all means, give people the support. There was a guy who came to me uh, just when I went in um, Westminster, and he had just, he was trying to transition. And as a human, fellow human being, one to another, the guy was distraught when he came in to meet me. Um, and I gave him a hug. This is pre-COVID, obviously. And I, I, I committed I will do whatever I can, but not just for him, for his family. The state his daughter, son and wife were in. As he spoke about this, they have to deal with it at school or at work or at or going out to the shops. This this is this is serious. We we need to we need to help not just the individuals going through it, but the families that are there for them. And we need to educate people to understand this better. But it's not the priority. It's 0.04% of the population. By goodness, help them. Help these people and help the, the, the families. But we will have the money to be able to do this if we get independence and fix all the other ills. More children are getting into poverty. Why aren't we, why aren't we fixed? Why are we abandoning that? Why are we allowing our oil and gas to be stolen? Why are we allowing the Crown Estates to be farmed off? Why are, the list goes on and on and on. The only fix is Indy. Everything else is just dancing about the handbags. Okay. Now, on this, Ian, before I get your comments on it, but the other one, just in something that Phil touched on, is about poverty, and, and it's true. I saw an exchange on this this very subject about twice the, the civil servants working in GRA and Nicola Sturgeon's uh, office manager, Mary Hunter, the councillor, probably was one of the ones that took the decision about increasing fuel prices in Glasgow. Uh, and the same woman who says that the, the issues of tra transing, uh, transitioning people is more pressing and uh, uh, more serious than poverty, child poverty. Now, that's not... <laughs> That's not my thinking. I don't know about you, but that's all part of that same thing, Ian. Um, why is twice the amount of uh, civil servants working in this? Well, as you know, I always try to look for a silver lining in any situation. And I mean, what we're talking about here is civil servants under the direction of Leslie Evans, you know? So it's maybe quite good news if there's very few of her civil servants working in independence, because my bets would be they'd be working for the other side. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be working to help us bring about independence. They might be trying to come up with some new obstacles, uh, given that all the obstacles put up by Better Together back in 2014 are now proven to be completely false. They're going to need new ammunition. But no, I mean, it's just an indication. Phil's right. It's an indication of a party that's lost all sense of priority. He's abandoned the prime directive who are, you know, so far away from the real purpose of the Scottish National Party and of the Yes movement as you could possibly get to. Who would believe that you would have a senior councillor, uh, you know, arguing that GRA reform is more important than child poverty in Glasgow? Has she no idea of the history of Glasgow? Has she no idea of the suffering? over generation after generation of kids 
you know, living in abject poverty. And she thinks whether some guy can get me a dress on a Friday night with somebody poking fun at him. She thinks that's that that's a bigger priority. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, I think if you put her in a hall with mothers from Glasgow, I think she wouldn't get out, you know, if she said something like that. Because people, ordinary people, know what the poverty is like in some areas of Scotland. Not just in Glasgow, by the way. There's poverty yeah. in a lot of places, including a lot of rural villages. People yeah. always think poverty only applies in city centres and, and big towns and cities. It happens all over the country. And people are all over the country are struggling to get by at the moment. Some of them aren't making it at the moment. And yeah. all we can see uh, is that things are going to get much worse. So, you know, if Murray Hunter's got anything to do about the run, when they're running the Glasgow, Glasgow, you're in trouble. You know, it's as simple as that. But here's the other thing, Phil. Um, the SNP, the, the Scottish National Party, the Party of Independence. I noticed today that Stuart McDonald, two of your ex-colleagues, Stuart McDonald and uh, Alan Smith for definite, possibly jo John Nicholson as well, but I don't know for definite about John Nicholson. I saw a picture. Those two guys are in Kiev in the Ukraine discussing the international implications of the, the conflict with Russia, the, the possible conflict with Russia and NATO's intervention. And uh, Nicola's also been talking about the big bad Russians. Tell me, what the f has that got to do with Scottish independence? Why are we putting our nose into something like that when we've got Glasgow and Dundee and the, everywhere, as Ian's pointing out, full of poverty, where our prices of fuel are going to, we're in abundance are going through the roof? And these guys are swanning off to Ukraine to play at foreign diplomats. This is a guy who was a holiday rep, a holiday rep, and he's now suddenly an expert on foreign policy. It's a joke, Philip. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's got nothing to do with independence is the answer to the first question. This is uh, SNP meddling again in some things that we should not be meddling. It's the same as when we, we, we tried to stop Brexit. What the hell are we trying to stop? What are we trying to stop Brexit for? The difference here, though, at least then we had somebody, exper an expert in the field with Joanna Cherry QC, no less, dealing with the legal issues there too, and, and, and won some victories, if you could call them. I think the objective was a wrong one. I think fighting for stopping Brexit was a foolish foolish decision, foolish strategy yeah. manoeuvre. But here we have, what, what, what is Stuart saying? Mean, I, I, listen, I got on well with Stuart. Stuart, I got on well with Stuart when I was there. Um, but I know he's got no qualifications in this. And I don't believe Alan Smith has. I've only spoken to Alan a few times. He wasn't down there when I was there. <clears throat> but they have no experience in this issue. And, and what are you talking about? Remember that Putin's right-hand man stipulated that Britain was a small island that nobody listens to anymore. Um, what, what is the couple of representatives with no qualifications of a region within a small island that nobody listens to anymore going to do for anybody except, well, who's benefiting out of this? The Ukrainians aren't going to. What are we going to do? Send the Scottish army in to fight the Russians? It's nonsense. I, I, we need we need to stop playing these games. This this is British coming games. Apart. These are games. games. These are games, and they're diversionary. And my party needs to get its together. It really does. It, it this. I I I I see some <laughs> trouble, some serious trouble ahead within the party because there's a growing number of people like me who are very unhappy with the directions that we are moving in further and further away from India, and then he's sawn off doors, sending completely unqualified people to negotiate on issues we've got no business or authority on, and suffering and not complaining about the, the, the pain that our people are going through and are just about to face. No, we need some serious transition in SNP very, very soon. Probably transition was the best word to use there, but never mind. <laughs> but, but the other one, I believe Ian, I don't know if it's true, apparently, I, you know, he was, as I say, he was a holiday rep, Stuart McDonald, before he became an MP. And when he arrived in Kiev and walked into this room full of all these uh, Ukrainian uh, members of parliament, etc., he did say, hi de hi, but no one replied to him. I don't know <laughs> if that's true or just a story. <laughs> uh, um, 
But the, the one good, thing I, it's a good joke. It's a good joke. Thank you very much. I, I just, just came me. I thought I had to throw it in there. But um, here's just the fact we're, we're finally coming to the end as usual, guys, so quickly. It doesn't seem like it. But if anything, with the civil servants not working in this properly, and I believe, call me the old cynic, uh, Ian, I believe as soon as we're past the election, <laughs> it'll stop again. They'll be pulled off it. Or in a couple, or a couple of weeks before the election, they'll be pulled off doing anything for it. There's not going to be an election in 2020, a referendum rather than 2023. It's not going to happen. Um, it's just the, the, the processes that have got to be put in place tells you it can happen, can it? No, it can. I, I mean, I, I, when I think back, when I first joined the SNP in 1986, the big, first big campaign I got involved in was the governed by election. And I went with Jim Sellers down to Wine Alley, which is notorious, one of the areas of the highest poverty in Glasgow. And Jim made one of the finest speeches I've ever heard in my life. Because at that time, the SNP was a campaigning organisation that was promising to get people decent housing, to try and end child poverty, to do all these things. He made an outstanding speech. And there was no reaction. And we all went away to Amy's Cafe in Govan and we sat down and said, Jim says, that, well, that's as good as I've got. I haven't got anything better than a fire there. And there was no reaction. And we had a discussion, Jim Sellers, myself, and uh, James Mitchell, the Professor James Mitchell. And we decided at the end of the conversation, the reason it had no impact was because these people had given up all hope. They didn't believe anyone could make life better for them. So we had to think, how do we get by that? So we came up with the idea, we'll go back and make the same speech. But all the kids that were running about the snappy bus, we'll talk about them all the time and why everyone's got to hope that their life's going to be better. And Jim went back and made the same speech and all the time he interjected, and it's for these kids round this van that that's the reason why this is important. This is why it needs to happen. There needs to be change, and only you can do it for these kids. And it was instantaneous. They were sending them for posters. The people that were with us were handing out posters. They were up all over the windows. And we left that street. This is the first day of campaigning. And Jim said, we can win this election. We've got the message. And all we did for three or four weeks was go around making that same speech, talking about the kids in the street, talking about why life had to be better for them. And that gave people hope. Just like 2014, the housing estates all voted yes because we gave them hope. We were talking with vision, with ambition, about telling them what can be done. We weren't in the ambi pambi, middle class socials, you know, psychological problem solving for a tiny, tiny minority. We were talking about the big issues. That's what the SNP were good about. He campaigned on housing, poverty, freedom, self-respect, making life better for our kids. That's the way forward. The whole Yes movement needs to do that. And we won't go anywhere until we start. I agree. So do you see a, a referendum happening in 2023? No, and I hundred percent agree with Ian. The whole Burns not bombs philosophy was hundred percent on the money, and one of the reasons we we did give hope. Now, twenty twenty three, I don't want a referendum anyway. I think it's foolish. No. I think if we're playing those games, when you, I'm, I'm looking at all of these dead ends that we're wandering down, try ask Nicola to go down and give a speech in lieu of Jim Sellers in the same area, sawing the bottom off doors getting men with dresses and women's <laughs> toilets. And we've got to do it for the kids. We've got to show the bottom of your door off for the kids. I mean, have they never heard of intumescent seals and fire safety in one of our fire doses? You know, I'd love to have seen that. That's the right answer. The fire service will just laugh at you and say, this, this is a joke. And I don't care who it's coming from. This is a joke. It's also illegal. You clown should be the answer that came from the fire service and whoever makes that suggestion. But um, anyway, no, it's not going to happen in 2023. I've, I've had enough of the lies. I really have. 
Um, we, we need to take stock here and our leadership needs to turn around and be honest with people. So tell the truth. Tell the truth. What's your game? What are you up to? It would be nice, a bit of truth. Well, we're at the end. Ian, when I'm thinking now over the, the years we've been doing this and writing blogs and getting attacked because we've been saying it and now we're saying you're not going to get a referendum in 2023. Everything we've told them we've been right about. I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory, but all of us have been telling them that there are things that were going to happen. Um, and we're telling them again now, 2023 is not going to happen. It's going to come and go. Um, we need a new strategy. This, this program here, my blogs, your blogs, have said plebiscite election, back to the old SNP policy that yeah. students yeah. from 1934 to 1999, every general election, be it Edinburgh or in London, is a plebiscite. We need to win one, just one. They need to win every single one. <clears throat> um, they ain't going to do that. That's what well, we need to be doing, and we need to be campaigning day and night. Yeah, and we need to be campaigning on the right issues. The issues Correct. that matter to the vast majority of people in Scotland. You know, uh, people think that folk that are middle class are unaware of the poverty. They're not. They know it's there. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's nobody has driven into them how it affects their lives. I mean, it's not in middle class people's interest. They have a whole pile of people in poverty. You know, if we can raise the living standards of everyone to a reasonable standard, the whole of society benefits. There's mm -hmm. less crime, you know, yeah. there's better education because there's not the level of disruption in class health issues. It's less health issues. Everyone benefits. And mm -hmm. what we need is a party that makes that message, but yeah. above all, has some vision, has some ambition, encourages people to take responsibility. Because Phil's right, that's one of the big problems in Scotland. Too many people in Scotland don't take responsibility for their own lives, never mind their kids' lives. And we need mm. to encourage people to take that responsibility. And it can all be done, and it can all be done quite quickly if we all acted together instead of getting diverted onto a whole lot of nonsense that's going to take Scotland absolutely nowhere. And it's costing us the best opportunity we've ever had to be independent because we're facing an incompetent and stupid Westminster. But they're not incompetent when it comes to holding on to Scotland. And we've got the wrong people defending us. And that's what we need yeah. to sort out. Correct. Starting in May, folks, you've got to start with May. Um, gentlemen, as always, it's been a pleasure, not a chore. Um, the time's flown in as usual. And uh, I thank you for your input. Your, your wise words and uh, your commitment. And to you, viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed talking to my two compadres here. It's always always fun. Um, and uh, as I said to you at the start of the programme, um, if you've got a Laku, branch, whatever you want us to turn up, we'll turn up. We, we turn up, we don't even have an envelope, anything. We're there and we'll be there for you. But until we see you again, please, please take care. Through a Scottish prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.